Hello everyone and welcome, this is Federico. Today we'll be discussing a new paper by uh, Shijedi et al, um, which is very highly related to the one, the video I made last time, which went really well, so I'm pretty excited. Um, today, this is a 2014 NIPS paper and talks about intriguing properties of neural networks. And, you know, just by the fact that it says intriguing, then uh, it must be pretty intriguing, right? So, and indeed it is. Um, we'll be only discussing about um, this last section here, which is spectral analysis of instability, because I'm a, a big fan of the of this formalization, and um, and the rest of the paper take just too long. So, because this part is again quite dense. So yeah, let's go over some background first, and this highly has to do with regularization. Now, let's say we are trying to fit um, some points here, right? Uh, and then uh, we are fitting a line. To them let's take blue what we can do is fit a line like this right and let's say it hits every point perfectly so it has zero loss instead what else, what another thing we could do is fit a line like this um, let me draw it <laughs> nicely right something like this as you can see the yellow line was meant to be like a lot less uh, unstable it's meant to like be a lot kind of nicer in a way <laughs> And the, while the blue one is, is clearly extremely overfitting. And we need some kind of notion to formalize this in mathematics. And one way to do it is by looking at the derivative, obviously. <laughs> and uh, and uh, one way to do it is by looking at this Lipschitz constant of a function. So let's say this is a function f, right? Now, let's say we have two metric spaces, which I'll kind of explain what they are later. Uh, y and with metric dy and x with metric dx and we have a function f which maps from x to y we want some way to kind of explain that this one function is more stable than the other well what we can simply do is look at uh, the distance between all the points so for all um for all x and y right where x is in x and y is in y yeah uh or sorry sorry where they're both in in x sorry <laughs> um so um what we can do is look at the at this distance function uh this metric uh, at, and look at the metric of the images for for every x and y right in in x and then we can look if it if it's bounded above by this uh by this other distance right and what could this remind you of right we have a dy dx which is bounded above right in by k I mean, this is not precisely the same, but it, it's quite a similar notion because if we divide by uh, by this term here, uh, then we get some kind of like dy dx ish uh, thing. So what we're looking at is uh, is how this function changes the gradient, and uh, it turns out that uh, obviously not all functions follow this property where k is is obviously in the real numbers, and obviously k is actually gr always greater than zero, right? Because uh, Okay, let's 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 maybe look at why. So, what's a metric first? A metric is a function uh, which maps from x to the reals, uh, such that um, I'll just I'll just avoid x because it's just cumbersome to write. We have that uh, x uh, this is equal to zero only if uh, x equal to y. We also have that it's symmetric, uh, so this is equal to dyx. Uh, and we also have that follows a triangle inequality. Um, so we have that uh, for obviously x, x, y, z in x, yeah. So x, x and z uh, is always bounded above by, uh, by x, y plus um, y, z, right? So this is what a metric space is. It's a set with a metric uh, which uh, follows these properties and it, it actually follows from these, th these three properties that actually we can restrict this, uh, codomain to only being positive, right? So it turns out that, uh, these three properties are enough to always show that this is, um, always positive or zero, zero in the case where X and Y are the same point. Cool. And this kind of gives us a quite nice definition of a metric. Uh, another thing I would like to talk about, let's say we have a normed vector space. So we have this x, which lives in uh, in Rn, right? Uh, then we can define a p norm, um, which is just considered the sum of i in n 
of xi to the pth power all over the pth root, right? And then what we can do is take a, any norm and metrize it quite trivially by uh, by just subtracting. So if we have x and y both in uh, in Rn, what we can do is uh, we can take the pth norm of x minus y, and this is a metric. Um, and this is quite trivial to show. Um, it turns out that the first two are obviously quite, I mean, quite straightforward from the definition of norms, which which is very very similar to 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 these, uh, maybe with some extra properties. And uh, and then the triangle inequalities actually follows from the Minkowski um, Minkowski inequality for p norms. Um, cool. And uh, and now let's actually get started with um, with the actual meat of the what is this? No highlighter. Um, so uh, independently, oh come on! <laughs> independently of their generalization properties across networks and trading sets, the adversarial example show that there exist small perturbations that produce large uh, small input perturbations produce large output perturbations. Cool. This kind of was what we went over in the last paper. Um, this section describes a procedure to measure and control the stability of the network. Uh, mathematically, if uh, if we have a neural network phi, um, where uh, phi is like this transformation here, right? Um, I guess up to here, uh, without without the output and input layer, um, we can rewrite it as the composition of these functions, uh, where phi k denotes the operator mapping layer k one k minus one to k. Um, the instability of phi can be explained by inspecting the upper Lipschitz constant of each layer defined as the because obviously you can have up I guess I didn't talk about but this is called the upper Lipschitz constant you can also have a lower Lipschitz constant and then you can have like by Lipschitz functions which are bounded by both above and below that's not really what we're interested in the instability of um, okay and um, and then we can pretty much rewrite this uh, thing we were talking about before in the terms of I guess general norms and perturbations so if we let y equal x plus r then we can rewrite this as uh, as this in terms of norms and of uh, and we're metrizing this norm pretty much and so pretty much what we get here if you if you remember here this is just like x minus x uh, uh, minus r and we can pull out the the r uh, because it's a norm <laughs> cool um, so uh, thus, what we can do is um, with this equation here. What what we can do is actually bound because this is per k layer. So this is the Lipschitz norm of that kth layer. What we can do is actually bound it above. Um, why? Because if we have a function, uh, let's say we have a function phi uh, one, and this has a Lipschitz constant k one, and let's say we have a function uh, phi two. With a Lipschitz constant of k2, it turns out that uh, the composition of these functions, oops, is is a, is bounded above by by the product of these two constants. So so what we can do is we can take this this and treat it as this composition here, right? So, so imagine pretty much instead of this, we're plugging this in there and in there, and then it turns out that then what we can do is treat this as as a large function composition, which is per layer, uh, where, where, where we're calculating the per layer constant, and then uh, we can then figure out the upper bound. Cool. So this is just the idea that we can actually compute an upper bound for this, for a whole network by looking at individual layers, because it turns out that computing the exact Lipschitz constant for a whole network is, is NP hard. There's a whole very nice paper on it, which gets very technical. And uh, it discusses a lot of these concepts and it's much more recent. I think it's from 2018, um, the, the other paper. Uh, a half rectified layer. Uh, so now here they go into detail on like, how do we kind of estimate these, uh, these constants, right? Or how do we calculate the constants for simple, simple layers? So we can ha look at half rectified layers, which are looking at the max between um, zero and the affine transformation. They also consider this uh, the operator norm of W, excuse me, where um, the W, uh, where the operator norm is the largest single value of this matrix. Uh, since this is a contractive nonlinearity, we can look at these inequalities 
So we're turning this into this uh, half uh, rectified layer. Uh, and then it turns out that it follows this inequality because it's contracted. And, uh, and then what we can do is that since W is a compact linear operator, uh, this, uh, this inequality holds uh, just because W is a matrix, which is finite, right? So it's, it's a nice uh, compact linear operator, right? Uh, so, so what we get here, it, this, if you look at here, is LK, right? Because this is in terms of R. Uh, so this is the Lipschitz constant of, of this uh, half rectified layer. Um, now we can do the other, the same thing for max pooling layer where we get this result. Uh, we can do the same for this um, contrast normalization layer, uh, which is this result. Uh, this may be a little discussion on this half, on this uh, max pooling layer. It talks about the Jacobian is the projection to a subset of the input coordinates and does not expand the gradients. In fact, here, the Lipschitz constant is of one as there's no expansion of the gradients, right? So, so if we have like a linear function, like f of x is x, right? Then the Lipschitz constant of this is just one, right? Um, okay, because it doesn't expand the gradients, like the gradient of this is zero, right? Or is one, sorry. <laughs> and there's no expansion of the gradient. Um, cool. And um, which corresponds to most? Okay, so these, I guess, were the most common pooling layers. And then, um, so it turns out that the unstability network can be obtained by computing the operator norms, which we have methods to because we have to just compute the singular values or the largest singular value of the matrix. Uh, the fully connected case is trivial. Um, if we look at the convolutional case, they do some cool math <laughs> to, it's not, I guess, so important for this video, but uh, pretty much you can compute it. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah. Um, cool. So again, it turns out that it means we can uh, compute the Lipschitz constants. So in this case, it's also, we can, uh, it's also this quantity here. Whoops, gamma. Um, so we can actually get these. Uh, so, so let's say we had uh, this layer here, and then we had composed with this layer here. Then we can, out, the upper bound would simply be the, if, if we compose them, right, would be some this quantity here, right? So as you can see, it's like, it's just a matter of computing these individual and then taking the product. And, you know, that's quite tractable computationally. Um, maybe some operations can be harder. For example, conv convolutional um, operators are obviously much more complicated than like linear operators, right? But um, I mean, it's still computable. Fourier transforms are some, um, I think fast uh, Fourier transforms, there's ways to compute them quickly. So it's not uh, definitely an approachable problem. They use, I mean, convolutional networks with five layers. So it seems to be tractable in practice. Um, so table five shows the upper Lipschitz bounds computed from the image uh, net deep convolutional network of, of nine, uh, which I, it's not so important, but uh, it shows that instabilities can appear as soon as the first convolutional layer. As you can see here, these upper bounds are exactly what we were discussing about before where we can compute them by using this, uh, this technique here. We can compute these upper bounds. Um, it means that uh, since these upper bounds are positive, what does it mean? Um, it means that the gradients are actually non, um, uh, they're non-stable because uh, w what it could intuitively mean is that they're bounded above by something which, um, which is above one right obviously uh and uh, it means that uh, a small perturbation can result in like an increase like a larger perturbation right so a small input perturbation is like a, actually a much has a greater significance uh yeah <laughs> like a small perturbation is amplified by the network or could potentially be amplified if it's the right one and uh, and obviously if we can keep it low, then uh, the potential is much lower. Uh, as you can see, for convolutional, it seems to be larger. I mean, I, I don't. It's it probably highly depends on these networks and whatever. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't like definitely. I wouldn't conclude that like convolutional networks are. I mean, it, it probably has to do something with the dimensionality of them and obviously other stuff. And um, yeah, so let's look at the conclusion. Uh, which is quite interesting. These results are consistent with the existence of blind spots, 
uh, but they don't attempt to explain why these blind spots occur. Um, and another <laughs> important thing is that we compute upper bounds. Large bounds do not translate into existence of adversarial examples. Um, why? Well, and just intuitively, if we have a large, so Lipschitz, like let's say we're taking the Lipschitz constant of phi, right? And this is bounded above by some delta. This will always be bounded below by some zero. If this delta is large, actually this goes, this can be in the entire domain. Um, this is in uh, zero to delta, right? Now, if delta is large, um, there's actually a whole range of values. So, so it could turn out that obviously, since this is just an, an estimation, that the actual Lipschitz constant is is closer to zero. We just it's just a, an approximation. Well, it's not even an approximation. It's just an upper bound on it. So we cannot really conclude anything. We can assume that for larger bounds, that this is actually most likely susceptible or more susceptible to an adverse attack. But in, in actual practice, like in practice, I mean, but in theory, it could be anything, right? It could still be, I guess, like a very low Lipschitz constant. On the other hand, if it's low, like let's say below one, uh, we can actually say, yeah, I mean, uh, this is quite a robust network because the this is actually, this this domain here is actually like restricted quite a lot. And, uh, and yeah, so this suggests, uh, which is maybe the most important takeaway, a simple regularization of parameters consisting in penalizing the, uh, the upper Lipschitz bound will help the, might help improve the generalization error of the network. Why? And well, actually, how can we do this? And uh, it turns out that there's some nice papers which actually go ahead and do this, uh, which are much more recent. Um, but what we can do maybe more simply, let's say we have this uh, max pooling layer, which has this, uh, oh, sorry, this is the rectified, half rectified layer. Let's say we have this half rectified layer, um, which has this Lipschitz constant of, uh, of WKR. Um, actually, sorry, of WK. So this is the singular value of the, of the weight matrix. What we can do is we can apply projection to this matrix, like a scalar projection. Let's let's call it, um, I don't know, uh, uh, phi uh, to WK. And, uh, and we can construct in such a way, so let's say WK is greater than some delta. Now we can const we we can recognize this right, and then we can say okay. What we do is we apply this phi to W k, such that we force it to be less than or equal to delta, and uh, we can. There's actually some nice techniques which it's not so complicated to do this, and uh, since obviously this this operation is not even that expensive, so it's actually quite doable. And this acts as a new regularizer. And in, in, in practice, what I think the biggest takeaway is the fact that this, um, um, this uh, Lipschitz constant is quite a nice intuitive way to think about regularization. Because although you might not, with our techniques, you not, might not be minimizing the, the global Lipschitz constant, what happens if you look at the domain? Well, you could also think about, or sorry, if you look at the subdomain of, uh, let's say, this interval here, um, it could just lower the Lipschitz constant of a specific uh, interval instead of the entire domain, which is still quite a nice way to think of it, in my opinion, because you're just looking at uh, quite a nice geometric uh, kind of uh, even algebraic definition of, of regularization, which, which is quite simple and quite elegant. And uh, yeah, hope this video uh, was enjoyable. Uh,